This is part two of a series of video interviews with Brian Livingston. He is the executive fellow at the School of Public Policy, University of Calgary, and he's written a series of intelligence memos for the C.D. Howe Institute titled Counting Carbon, a Reality Check on Our Emission Reduction Plan. So today we're going to talk about emissions in the oil and gas sector in Canada. So welcome to the interview, Brian. Glad to be here, Mark, uh, Markham. Just uh, the only thing I would add is uh, the presentations uh, and the, that you're referring to are available on the CD How website to all of your listeners. Indeed, and I will be providing a link in both the video version and the podcast version of the interview. Uh, and I would actually encourage everyone to check this out. There's, Brian has done the most detailed breakdown uh, that I've seen of oil, uh, oil, well, Canadian emissions in general. There are four presentations, and if you're really interested in this, you should have a look. So, Brian. Let's start with maybe just a quick overview of of the argument and the data in your presentation. Well, the numbers are that the uh, the emissions reduction plan that uh, ECCC put out in March of last year, 2022, said in 19, in 2019 the emissions from the oil and gas industry were 191 million tons, and their target in 2030 is 110 million tons. So you, so you can see the reduction is from 191 to 110, 81 is about 40 plus percent. So it's probably the most significant of all of the uh, seven emitting sectors in the uh, country uh, as far as a, a reduction is concerned. And it's been a discussion of much, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the news back and forth between the government and the oil and gas industry and, and others as to whether it's realistic or not. The Emissions Reduction Plan talked about various programs. They talked about carbon capture. They talked about the investment tax credits or ITCs for what I call point of combustion carbon capture, which is where you have a, a plant, a natural gas burning facility that you capture the flu, the CO2 and the flue gas. Uh, they also talked about direct air capture, which is something that's more um, on the technological frontier, but there are some pilot plants that are being built in that. And uh, they give it a, a very large 60% investment tax credit for that. They talk about uh, reductions in methane emissions. They talk about renewable fuels. They talk about renewable elect electricity. So they talk about a lot of different policies and programs, but they never get down to saying, okay, how much is each of those steps going to reduce emissions and which companies out there in the world are going to do it? That's what my uh, forecast does. It goes through each sector, oil sands, mining, in situ, upgraders, conventional refineries, pipelines for oil and gas, all that stuff. And then it goes through various companies, the Suncors and Novuses and CNRLs of the world, and, and says, how much is each of those uh, sectors going to, subsectors going to reduce emissions, and how much is each of those companies going to reduce emissions? Yeah, it's very detailed, and that's why I appreciate it so much, because this this analysis needed to be done. It's In fact, it should have been done long ago, uh, but it's very useful. So let's Better talk about... Never. Indeed. Let's talk about where the emissions are coming from in the subsectors of the uh, of the industry. Can you walk us through those numbers, please, Brian? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I don't have my numbers in front of me, so I'm, I'm going to be a, a bit approximate. There are a lot of charts, which I've... Uh, given to you or are available in my presentations and you probably are going to put this into the put them into the podcast the biggest ones are in situ and for those engineers in the in the crowd you know that in situ means in place means you uh, use an immense amount of natural gas to produce an immense amount of hot high pressure steam which you inject into the ground and through a process known as steam assisted gravity drainage or sag d as it's called the bitumen eventually makes its way back up to the surface and you produce it. So it, that, that industry or that sec, subsector has the highest emissions intensity. In other words, the most kilograms of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. Uh, the next biggest one is methane emissions or methane leaks. Methane emissions can come from two ways. One is where you flare the gas, which is intentional. And the other way is where it leaks out of whatever uh, producing facilities or transmission facilities you have, which are unintentional. And those are the two biggest ones. Refineries on a per barrel basis are not all that much, but there are a lot of refineries. Uh, pipelines, not too much because most of those operate uh, on, uh, a lot of those at least operate on electricity and can be converted to electricity. The mining uh, and the upgrading, it, it, yes, those have a significant amount of emissions, but not as much as the in situ. And, and the graphs that are on my presentation show that precisely how many barrel, how many mil, uh, millions of tons per each of those seven subsectors or eight subsectors. 
Well, uh, just for our uh, viewers and listeners, uh, let me quickly go through these numbers uh, because I do happen to have them in front of me. Uh, the oil sands is 85 megatons per year of emissions. Conventional oil is 25. Natural gas is 51. Refining and pipelines are 30 for a total of 191. And of course, it'll be roughly 40% reduction. That's what the federal government is estimating. And one, you know, you I would use think the word, that I would use the word targeting, not estimating. I would use the word targeting Nick, because that's what they've done. Fair enough. Fair enough. You can tell Brian's an engineer and a lawyer, so precision is important here. Uh, you think that the reductions are going to come from two major sources. Uh, what are those? Well, the first one is carbon capture, and that's where you say, let's say you have a, a boiler that's producing steam, and that steam, as I just said, is being used to inject into the ground to produce uh, bitumen from in situ production. That would be involve combustion, and this is the engineer in me speaking now, and the flue gas, the stuff that literally goes up the chimney, has a concentration of CO2 of in the order of 5 to 15 percent. It depends on, on the configuration, but 5 to 15 percent. Now, that uh, is in contrast to the air in which we all breathe, which has, I think, uh, 420 parts per million, which I believe is 0.042%. So it's a lot easier as an engineer to capture CO2 in flue gas with 5 to 15% uh, carbon concentration. And so that's what the Oil Sands uh, Pathways Alliance is proposing to do in a significant way to create carbon capture facilities that literally scrub the CO2 out of the flue gas before it goes out into the atmosphere concentrate it, put it in a pipeline, take that pipeline, put it down to a, a, an injection facility, which is on top of an old uh, production facility that's no longer producing, but still has pore space, and then inject it into the ground. That's carbon capture. CCUS is called carbon, cra carbon capture underground sequestration or CCUS. And that is the, uh, those facilities, which are significant in terms of investment required, those are the ones that are in, entitled to a, I believe, 50%, if I recall, investment tax credit under the recent budgets that have been put out by the federal government. Right. So let's talk about this for a minute, because Pathways Alliance is proposing a, uh, the, it, they say that it's going to take $75 billion by 2050 to decarbonize the, the oil sands. And about two thirds of that will be required for CCUS. So roughly fifty billion dollars. They're expect. They've actually asked. They've 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 talked about this publicly that they need about fifty billion dollars from governments to pay for this. The project starts at the I forget which 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 oil sands project is at the northernmost tip of the carbon pipeline, and then there will be feeders from the various projects. It'll terminate in Cold Lake in northeast uh, Alberta. And as you say, then be stored underground in an old uh, oil and gas re reservoir. That has not been approved yet. The, the approval, the, the companies are still working on their engineering and, and design work. And it hasn't received, none of that has received regulatory approval. And I've talked to uh, uh, Mark Cameron from the Pathways Alliance and the argument there from the companies is that if the federal government doesn't provide regulatory approval in short order, uh, probably this year uh, or very, very soon, they're not going to hit their carbon capture targets. And so I wondered, does that mean that the, your CCUS estimate might actually be a little high? Short answer is yes. Uh, if they don't build them in the time frame that they think they were going to build them, my estimates might be high. Well, let's talk about methane emissions, because uh, we remember back in 2015 when the Alberta government released its uh, cl uh, climate leadership plan, the call was for 40 to 45 percent uh, reduction in methane emissions. And that's important because methane is 80, 80 to 85 percent, uh, 80, sorry, 80 to 85 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 in the first 20 years. So if you're going to clean something up, uh, reducing methane emissions is uh, a good place to start, in addition to which every molecule of methane that you save is a molecule that the company can sell. So the companies sure. are, are are motivated to, to uh, stop the, the leaks. You're saying uh, you're estimating 17 megatons. Uh, the federal government recently raised the target to 75% reduction by, by 2030. Does that mean, Brian, that... Uh, you're, you've taken the 75% estimate? 
What I did, and again, this is in the presentation, is I looked at some charts that have been put together, which gave some assessments as how much, how many tons per year they, they could reduce. And they were sort of forecasting 10, maybe 15 tons. So I took it a little higher than that at, at 17 million tons per year uh, of methane reductions, uh, reductions in methane emissions. So I, I didn't really use the 75% target for the reasons I've given a minute ago, which is, I mean, the targets are just the targets. They never talk about how they're going to do it. What I wanted to do is to look at some hard data or some evidence to use my legal background and say how much realistically have people put out there in public on paper that says this is how much methane reductions we can expect to do in the next eight years between now and 2030. And so that's how I arrived at that number. Now, uh, the Pembina Institute, for instance, for example, has argued that because reducing CO2 in oil and gas, uh, sorry, CO2 emissions in oil and gas production is difficult, uh, the methane emissions are in fact like low hanging fruit. And one of the ways the industry can can hit these targets is to raise its ambition in in methane emission reduction by investing more heavily in in new equipment, that sort of thing. Um, what's your take on that? Well, I've, I've often said that methane emissions, you're right, uh, is basically losing product if you're a producer. So it is in your best interest to try to reduce them as much as possible. The first thing that technology has given us uh, recently, as I understand it, is detection. I mean, methane is, is colorless and, and to some large extent odorless, so you can't see it coming across the prairie, so to speak, as it, if it's been released. But they now have technology that can, from the air and even from, I, I think even from satellite space, can detect where emissions are, are occurring. So the first thing you have to do in order to reduce emissions is to figure out where the emissions are coming from, which is a lot more challenging than it perhaps sounds. It's not as simplistic as it sounds. The next one is to go to the technology and say, okay, how do we fix the leak, so to speak? And, and that's the technology that is coming along. Uh, the thing I would note is that the people, the companies who will reduce methane emissions are for the most part, the smaller oil and gas companies, as I call it in my presentations, the white caps and the crescent points and so on of the world, because they're the ones who have the, the existing natural gas producing facilities. The larger oil sands producers, to a large extent, don't have natural gas anymore. So you see, it's a kind of a, a, a not a two solitudes, but it's a two groups of companies with each with different objectives and, and different challenges to make. So it's really up to those smaller companies. And I say smaller, they're smaller than the oil sands companies. They're still significantly sized companies. And it's up to them to figure out the technology along the lines I've described, the detection of it, and then the uh, stopping the leaks and to make that happen. Whether they'll reduce their, or sorry, whether they'll increase their ambition, it's easy to say, sure, I'll increase my ambition. There are lots of things I'd like to do better. I'd like to lose 10 pounds. I'd like to do a whole bunch of things. But what it comes down to is what can they realistically do in the next eight years? And my assessment was the, the 17 million tons that you described is a realistic assessment of what they can do. That's a significant amount. Uh, don't don't uh, downgrade or downplay the amount. Uh, that's still a significant uh, task for them to do. Well, let's let's have that conversation because uh, the interview I did just before this one was with your colleague from CD Howe, Glenn Hodgson, who talked about uh, their intel his intelligence memo in which he argued that the uh, Canadian oil and gas, particularly the Alberta oil and gas industry, uh, looking ahead to peak oil demand in 2030, has now become a mature industry. It's cutting back on investment in production and in production expansion, and it's giving it's it's, it's focusing and concentrating on giving money back to shareholders. And in fact, enormous sums and a very high percentage of their free cash flow, according to the uh, investor presentations that, that I've looked at. And is there not an argument that these companies, instead of prioritizing the, the return to shareholders, I mean, that's important, granted, but this is an issue where if they were to invest more heavily, new technologies and rolling out the existing technologies like methane detection, for example, that we might get to those targets quicker. So what's your take on that? Well, my take on that is, is this. If you make something economic for an investment, people will invest in it. The real challenge, and, and this is to, to do also with, to do with methane uh, emissions reduction, but also for the direct air capture that I, I described, where you literally have uh, massive filters that take the carbon dioxide literally out of the air that we breathe. And there are some pilot projects that do that, but there has to be a legal regime in place that makes it economic. I mean, if I make shoes 
I want to know that I have a, a, a market for my shoes and I can sell my shoes and I'll have a revenue stream in order to make the investment in the shoe factory economic. In a similar way, if I were the government, I would say to them, you need to figure out in methane reduction and in direct air capture, how to design a legal regime that provides a revenue stream to investors in those facilities to reduce methane or to take the carbon dioxide directly out of the air and make it economic for them to make the investment. If you do that, well, then maybe they won't uh, return the money to shareholders. Maybe they will invest in those facilities because that's what companies tend to do. If there's an attractive investment opportunity available, they will invest in it. So government has to sit down and think, how do we make an attractive regime, legal regime for companies such that they will be encouraged on their own? We won't have to force them to do it. They will do it on their own. Adam Smith's invisible hand will occur and they will invest in those facilities to reduce emissions and to take air uh, carbon dioxide directly out of the air. A quick follow-up question, Brian. What do you make then of the federal government's mulling over uh, the contracts for difference around the carbon price that they're talking about? I, I think it's in the discussion phase now. Uh, there's some support within industry for it. What do you, what's your take on that? Well, that could work. And, and, and for, I, I'm actually doing some work today as I speak on uh, direct air capture to try to put together the legal regime that I've just described. What uh, what a, a contract for difference is, uh, that's what Glenn Hodgson and others call it. Blake Schaefer calls it the same thing. I call it a guaranteed price, six of one, half dozen of another, whichever term you want to use. But it gives a certainty to people building, let's say it's a direct air capture to use a carbon price, and to say, you will get, if you take a ton of uh, carbon dioxide out of the air, investor, you will get a guaranteed price or a contract for difference price, same, same difference, of X dollars per ton for doing so. And that will give some revenue certainty to companies as they decide whether to build or not to build a direct air capture facility. Very, very brief analogy, about five or six years ago, the government of Alberta wanted people to build solar facilities and wind facilities to generate electricity. So they put together what they call their renewable X, renewable X electricity program, which or REP, and they said, okay, you build your solar facility, we'll guarantee you through a contract for differences pro process, X cents per kilowatt hour or megawatt hour for the electricity. And that gave certainty to the people so they could go and build these solar facilities. The people who built them uh, took all the risk of capital costs and operating costs and everything else. Uh, but they at least knew that they had a guaranteed revenue source. In the same way, uh, you would make a, a certainty through a contract for differences so people will go out and build uh, direct air capture facilities and perhaps go out and build methane capture facilities as well. Well, let's talk about the oil sands because the oil sands uh, all by itself is 10 or 11, uh, well, I think it's 11 or 12% now of uh, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the things that uh, is obvious to me by looking at the data, Brian, is that as long as supply has risen, emissions have never come down. They have plateaued at best. Now they're rising again. They were 72 megatons in 2017. Now they're 80. IHS market says they'll be 90 by, by 2025. If CCUS is not put in place, they might be somewhere between 90 and 100. Um, where is that coming from? What can, I mean, aside from CCUS, what else can be done to get those emissions under control. And, but another and a related question is, did you take into account the rising supply when you were doing your calculations? Uh, the short answer is on supply is, is I held it constant. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of debate about whether that's true, whether that's a correct assumption or not. Uh, it was a sim simplifying assumption. The reason why emissions have gone up, uh, what they call emissions intensity has dropped, i.e. so many kilograms per barrel produced but the number of barrels has increased as you just indicated. So if you multiply A times B, you, you still get a slightly bigger number. So that's why the emissions, total emissions in millions of tons per year has been going up. Uh, in terms of, of what more can they do? I mean, carbon capture is a big item that they wanna do. Small modular reactors is something that has been put forward. Uh, I mentioned that you use natural gas to burn, you burn natural gas to produce steam to put down into an in situ. If you use a small modular reactor, which is a, produces heat, you could use that as a source of energy and that's a non-emitting source of energy. So that's an, another method that could be used. In any of the work that I saw, I could not find anybody who was proposing to build a small modular reactor and operate it before 2030. Yeah, exactly right. And the only one in, in, uh, in 
Canada is Ontario Power and Generation, which thinks it may have a, an SMR up by 2028, but it could be 2035. They're not sure at this point. So it's still a uh, wild card technology uh, is the way we think of it. But let's talk about Suncor. Now, I've in, in the investor presentations that I went through, Suncor is the only oil sands company, or at least was a year ago, that was promising to reduce uh, their total their their absolute emissions. And they currently produce about uh, 29 megatons, and they were going to take it down to 19 megatons. That's reflected in in your data. And part of it was a switch from a switch to uh, value over volume. And they were going to hold their production at 800,000 barrels a day. They were going to hold that constant instead of increasing it. And they were going to try to lower their costs, their production costs, in, the, in order to uh, provide increasing returns to their, to their shareholders. But that also enabled them now to bring down their emissions as well. And with some of the investments they're going to make in Cogen and, and so on. So what's your take on, on Suncor's efforts? Well, they've put it out publicly on a public document. So, uh, you know, they, they they wouldn't have done that unless they had a, a fairly strong belief that they were would be able to achieve them. That that would be my view. I mean, public companies don't say things unless they believe they can do it. I mean, that's one of the rules of disclosure: disclose the truth as as you see it. So they have a variety of things. It's not just carbon capture, though. They do have carbon capture because they have everything at Suncor. They have in situ, they have mining, they have upgrading, they have refineries, uh, and they have a little bit of conventional production, if I recall as well. So they, they will have a, a smorgasbord, as it were, several ways of reducing emissions. And will they make it? Well, I mean, I can sit there and, and sit there and say, yes, they will, no, they won't, uh, but time will tell. But as I say, they've said publicly that they will, so I place a lot of uh, credence in that. What about uh, investing in innovative technology? Now, the the industry, the oil and gas industry is a an interesting one, and I worked in it for five years, and I talked to many engineers just like you, Brian, uh, in the course of, of that employment. And one of the things that is true, uh, two things are true. Uh, one is in a, they're very, very innovative. They, they come up with with wonderful technical solutions to getting oil out of the ground a mile or mile and a half uh, below the surface. Mark, when I was an engineer, they used to tell me that the very difficult we can do right away, the impossible takes a little longer. <laughs> well, I can uh, I, I can vouch for that, having seen it in, in action. But the other thing is that they're also very risk averse. And I've been talking to interviewing companies like Synovus and, and Suncor for years now, and they've had technology like, like solvent substitution and other technologies. They're currently uh, piloting uh, a company uh, technology called Acceloware, where they basically use uh, radio frequency uh, uh, heat to heat up the uh, uh, heat up the uh, the SAG D uh, process. Uh, sorry, provide heat into the reservoir so that they don't need steam or as much steam anyway, uh, in the SAG-D process. Markham, um, that, sounds like an un that sounds like an underground microwave oven. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And, and I interviewed the CEO of Acceloware and that's how he described it. So we're we're on solid ground here. My, my point here is that I can imagine a world in which the Acceloware technology works, the companies build renewable wind and solar up and near their projects, and they get rid of the burning natural gas to, to make steam. And that kind of innovation doesn't seem to be, now I, I, I yeah, sure I'm second guessing the companies, but I think it's fair to say, this is a company that are, are prior, prioritizing returns to shareholders and not investing perhaps as much as they, they should in order to reduce emissions and trying out, you know, commercializing this, these innovative technologies quicker. Uh, I, I I can anticipate your argument, but let's let's hear your your uh, your take. Well, on I, I guess the short short answer I would give is you'd have to ask them why aren't you doing it? Is it because it's not economic? Is it because there's there's no uh, internal rate of return that you can generate on it? Is that why you're not doing what you're doing? Because then, as a government, you have to do one of two things, or perhaps more things, but you have at least two choices. Number one is to say. As I said earlier, we'll make a, a legal regime that makes gives you an economic incentive to do it, which is the carrot way of doing things. 
or as uh, the sun in the sun in the wind uh, story, that's the sunny way of doing things. Or we can bring out the regulatory stick and hit you with it and say, look, you're going to do this or else. And that's the, the wind way of doing things where, you know, where you force people to do something, even though they aren't voluntarily doing it. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that the kind of dialogue that I guess needs to happen. And I, I would assume has been happening. And for whatever reason, and, and you're probably closer to it than I am, uh, it hasn't gained uh, traction yet in terms of getting people to uh, do some of the, the uh, innovative technology that you've described. Well, Brian, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. It, it's really important because it uh, it doesn't appear that the oil and gas industry at this point uh, will hit the federal government's targets. The federal government has said that it's going to bring in an oil and gas emissions cap with presumably regulatory sticks if the uh, if those targets aren't met. This and this is going to be a very contentious issue that will play out over the next few years. And we'll be watching it with great interest. Thank you very I, much for I, this. Well, I try to stick away from politics, but yes, that oil and gas cap will be very contentious if it comes in in a draconian sort of way. Especially Good stuff. If they... we'll, we'll be looking forward to the uh, the interview on the third part of your of your intelligence memo. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Markham.